I think that identity crisis is such a real problem. Like that is probably the reason I haven't retired yet, or one of the reasons mm. I haven't officially it's a real retired. Thing. It's a real because thing. Because it is hard to figure out who you are and what you want to do outside of sport. Hello and welcome to About Time, the show where we have long overdue conversations about the journey of women in sports. I'm Marky Freeman, athlete, author, fan of sports, and an even bigger fan of the women who are changing them. In today's episode, we'll hear how one woman's life-altering cancer diagnosis shaped her future in a way she couldn't have imagined. I'm thrilled to introduce today's guest, the incredible Natalie Snyder. A true powerhouse in wheelchair basketball, she has not only etched her name as a Team USA athlete, but has become a source of inspiration for all. But before we go into our interview with Natalie, a quick word from our sponsor, WeCoach. This interview is brought to you by WeCoach. Prior to Title IX, over 90% of women collegiate sports teams were coached by women. Today, over 50 years later, that number has decreased to 41%. That's why We Coach launched Move the Numbers to help change the landscape for women coaches and the student athletes they lead. We Coach is a one of a kind nonprofit membership organization dedicated to recruiting, advancing, or retaining women coaches in all sports and levels through year round professional growth and leadership development programs. We Coach fosters a diverse and inclusive community of over 10,000 coaching leaders who inspire young women to follow in their footsteps. If she can see her, she can be her. Together, we move the numbers to support and increase women in coaching. We teach, we inspire, we motivate, we lead, we coach. Visit our website at wecoachsports.org. That's wecoachsports.org. Beyond the court, Natalie's impact extends to being a 2023 Sports Woman of the Year Award recipient from the Women's Sports Foundation. Join us as we unravel the layers of her story, from the highs and lows of her athletic career to her commitment to advocacy for para-athletics. Please welcome Natalie Snyder. Hi, I'm Natalie Schneider, and it's about time we start talking about the Paralympics. First, before anything, I have to congratulate you on qualifying for Paris 2024. That is amazing. Thank you. It's it's a nice relief. Like, I think we were like, I felt confident we were going to qualify, but being on the other side and being done is feels really good. Now we can just focus on Paris and not focus on qualifying. Now, this will be your fifth Paralympic game. What does it mean to represent your country on a stage like this? Man, it's just, it's not like anything that I've ever experienced before. You know, getting to like wear USA across my chest and represent the country on that world stage is just the most amazing experience, which is why I keep coming back for more. And you have had a well-decorated career, and we're going to dive into that. But <laughs> it started at a very young age. Back in high school, your sophomore year, you led your team to a state tournament. And then you received some life-altering news and diagnosis. I mean, I can't imagine what that was like being 15 or 16 years old and receiving a cancer diagnosis. But how did you keep yourself grounded during that time? You know, yeah, that was definitely one of the hardest times of my life. Um, I had such big goals and stuff and like finding out that I had cancer um, was actually like less devastating to my 16 year old brain than the part where the doctor came and said, you are never going to run or jump again. So it was really devastating, but I had so much support at home. I'm from a small town um from Crete, Nebraska. Like the whole town rallied around me. My family was amazing. And that just all really kept me grounded. Recently you said in an article that there was something a million times worse than receiving that mm -hmm. cancer diagnosis. Can you talk a bit about that? You know, being 16 and like finding out I had a malignant tumor, like I didn't even know what the word malignant meant. And I had all these plans and goals. I like, I love, love basketball. And I had dream like my whole life, I was gonna go on to college and I wanted to play division one basketball in college. And I 
wanted to go on to the WNBA and play there. So like going in and thinking that I was going to have like the meniscus cartilage fixed in my knee and be right back at it was like, was one thing I was already struggling with that. And then I went in and instead they said, you're never going to run or jump again. You won't be able to play basketball again. You'll just have to find another outlet for your competitive nature. And like, maybe you can be a swimmer or a golfer. (laughs) It's like, yeah, that's not the same as like being on the court. So just having my identity as an athlete kind of stripped from me as a basketball player, like just taken from me the same day that I found out I was going to spend the next year of my life getting cancer treatments and chemotherapy was, was just devastating. Recently we had COVID and sports stopped for, for most of us abruptly. And Mm -hmm. I mean, it was taken away, but I think most of us knew that we would get it back at some point in time. But I think for me personally, during that experience, I gained a new sense of gratitude during that period in my life. What would you say you gained over that year of of chemotherapy and just self-reflecting and and just going through this challenging period? That was such a hard period. Like I felt like I lost a bit of myself and mm. at that time of life your friends are doing all these fun new exciting things and so I just really learned like because I was constantly missing school, missing out on like going to f- high school football games and like watching my brother play football and watching my sister play college basketball. So I think in that year, like I really, it was sort of s- similar to COVID where like you couldn't do anything. Like I couldn't do any of the things my friends were doing. And so I just really learned not to take anything for granted life kept going on without me like COVID, everything stopped but like when you're going through cancer treatments as a high school kid like everyone's lives are still going on without you and you're just like in this bubble of your own it's really difficult so you really learn not to take anything for granted so during that period so many things happened but how did you come to discover the parasport community so I didn't discover the like parasport community until I was almost done with college. So it was six years later. My mom actually discovered it through sitting volleyball. There was an article in the Omaha paper about a sitting volleyball tournament that was held in Omaha. Shout out to out, Omaha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it turned out that uh, Brent Rasmussen was the captain of the USA men's sitting volleyball team at that time. And he'd been hosting a sitting volleyball tournament in Omaha to like raise awareness and stuff. And my mom saw that and thought it was something that I could potentially do. And so I reached out to Brent and and he's a great friend now. And he got me involved in all of that. And started playing sitting volleyball, like went to a USA sitting volleyball camp, which was awesome. Uh, And then it turned out that the guys on my sitting volleyball team said, hey, you should play on our wheelchair basketball team. And I never looked back after that. (laughs) And here we are. Those are one of the benefits of being from a small town because everyone knows everyone and they're all a part of the journey. They're all a part of the support system that helps elevate us during our highest Mm -hmm. of highs as well as our our lowest of lows. And so for for other athletes who are interested in getting involved in the para community, the para sport community, what advice would you give them? I would say start like researching what opportunities are available in your community. It is the para sport community is so small. If you reach out to one person who's like involved in para sports or adaptive sports, they'll be able to hook you up with like any number of people. There's a lot of overlap. I was just talking to a kid last week actually who recently got had his leg amputated and he really wants to do track. He wants to like make the USA Paralympic track team someday. And so I was like, well, I don't have a track coach to call, but I I know people who are in the track program and I can like give you their number and, and hook them up. So really it's just start looking and you will find, you will find people to, to talk to. 
And training for the Paralympic level is no different than training for able-bodied. You're going to hit the weight room. You're going to be working, working hard and everything you do will help. Let's talk about that because you're currently preparing for the 2024 games in Paris. What does that routine look like for you? And and just for clarity, for clarity in those listening, um, you have played in each game since 2008. That is a ton of time. All right, we'll let you do the math on that. There's a game played every four years. So you have had to keep yourself in great shape for years and years. What is your routine? <laughs> been some crazy years too. Uh, <laughs> I got three babies in that time. Oh, I'm really wow. proud of that. I've come we back from talk three about kids. That. <laughs> no doubt. Like I'm laughing because I just we just finished Pan American Games, so I took my like one week off and got back at it yesterday. So my routine is like I'm weight training three days a week, so that's at least like an hour to an hour and a half of just strictly weight training. And then I'm getting in my my basketball chair like three to five times a week, depending on what the schedule allows. So it's like doing three shooting intensive workouts and doing three conditioning workouts a week just to get ready for our tryout camp in January. We have like our official like first round tryout is in January. And then we'll be training together. The whole team is decentralized. So we'll get together typically in Colorado Springs or in Lakeshore in Birmingham, Alabama. We all fly in for like a long weekend, like Wednesday through Sunday training camp and train together about once a month up until Paris. Yeah, the the physical, mental, and nutritional routine of high-level athletes is is second to none. And so maybe you can help me get back into the swing of things because once I retired, I was over it all. Bring on the pizza. <laughs> but <laughs> but Paris sports is something that I personally don't believe the world knows enough about. How can we as as fans, sport fans, parents, communities, the media, what can we do to support para athletes? Like the more we talk about it, the better. Like I love that we're we're talking about it here on About Time because we need to talk about it more. I think the interest will be there, but you have to have it available, right? So Tokyo, I think we did a much better job of televising the Paralympics. I've I've really got to see the progression of how the Paralympics has come along in my career. It's been a really cool time to be a Paralympian going from 2008 where nobody had heard of the Paralympics to now I can actually like talk to people or they'll and they'll they'll have actually heard of it when I'm like flying somewhere with my ball chair they'll say oh are you a Paralympian and get excited about it which is amazing but yeah people actually know about it or people will have seen me on tv which is super cool I used to have people like in other countries say oh I saw you play are you number eight and it was just the coolest thing now you you briefly spoke to being a mother of three which makes you superwoman, all right? Yeah. You're a two-time gold medalist. You have a bronze medal as well. Seven natties, that's national championships, people. Seven national championships. <laughs> and you're a mommy of three. What is it that you want those three little girls to know about their mommy? I want them to see like how far they can push themselves. Like I've Every time I've had a baby, right, I've been tempted to just hang it up and retire. Like, that was always my plan, right? And then I I realized, like, not only did I still love the sport and love to play, but I also realized what I can show them as far as, like, they see me in the gym. They come to the gym with me. They see how hard I work. And I want them to realize that, they're in control of their dreams and their destinies. Like as long as they're willing to work for what they want, like I want to be that example for them that they can do whatever they want as long as they are willing to put in the work for it. But a question for you, because we have so many people that have come on about time and they are the the highest of achievers in terms of their careers, but they're also wives and mommies like you. How do you manage family and career? It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot to manage. 
like I was just talking to a friend last night at a ball game. I was like, it really does take a village to do anything like this, right? I know it's a cliche, but it's so true. You know, I've got so much support around me. When I was in Chile for two weeks, my kids were in school, they had Thanksgiving break. And so I had different parents picking them up, my parents, my husband's parents, my sister's family, all these different people. I had to write the kids a note a day of like, this is what the day looks like today because these different people are going to pick you up from school and whatever. So no one has success by themselves, right? It always takes so many people. And it's only because of all the people around me that I'm able to do what I do. Yeah. And I've heard people say that it, it's a constant fight for balance. I think for well, me, it's a, it's a matter of harmony because when I think about balance, everything is equal. And when it comes yeah. to family, career, social life, other things that we're passionate about, I don't think those different buckets deserve equalness, right? I think it deserves yeah. harmony. And so there's a certain portion that goes here, but I would love to say that that more of it should go to my family for me. And so that creates a harmony that I think keeps us internally more balanced mm -hmm. than anything else. So more of a fight for harmony for me. Yes, I love that idea so much because the more basketball I play, the more I'm finding ways to include the kids, like mm -hmm. make sure they come with us on basketball trips. They, they got spoiled and don't even know how spoiled they were by getting to go to Dubai this summer for world championships wow. because I was like, I, I want to do this, but I need to have the kids around. Like I need them to be a part of it. I think I looked somewhere and I saw that you're coaching your girls now. How is that experience? <laughs> it's fun. It's also hard when you coach your own kids. I've got three daughters and they are six, eight, and 10. So, well, my 10 year old, has special needs. So she is not playing sports, but I'm helping coach her classmates because mm -hmm. she's she's nonverbal and, and globally delayed. But I decided that if Rowan was typically developing, I'd be coaching her. So I decided to go ahead and coach her, her classmates. So I've been helping coach them and it's just so much fun. I love it so much. Able-bodied basketball is different than wheelchair basketball, so I have like a learning curve. And I know I played able-bodied basketball, but like you said, that was a really long time ago. <laughs> I love it when the kids like pick up different things. Like we do a kindergarten through second grade clinic, so I get to coach my other two daughters in that, and that's been so much fun just just seeing them learn and and grow as athletes. What would you say is the biggest difference between coaching or playing as a Paralympian and coaching able-bodied basketball? And coaching, oh man, coaching is so much harder. <laughs> I, I guess apparently I must be a bit of a control freak and it, the coaching <laughs> drives me crazy because I feel like I have no control over the situation at all. When I'm playing, I'm like, oh, okay, I can really make a big impact whether I'm in the game or out of the game. I feel like I'm making a big impact on the team. And coaching, you're trying to teach as much as you can using your words and like kind of demoing stuff and practice when you can. But ultimately, it's up to the players to perform and sitting back and watching the players can be a little frustrating at times. No, but I, I'm sure it's an honor to be coached by you. And every coach has their own philosophies. They have something that they hang their hat on. or and, and in coaches talk, we call it something, a hill we would be willing to die on. Is there a hill that you're more willing to die on when it comes to coaching those young girls? Oh, man, I'm I'm all about the defense and the effort. I love that you can control your attitude and effort is a very mm. popular thing to say and I love that because that really is what you can control your attitude and effort and so that's something I really kind of harp on with the girls that I coach is having a good attitude and being a good teammate being a good teammate goes so far in helping everyone on the team perform at their best yeah they say that the the team always takes on the identity of the coach 
And you talked yeah. about attitude, attitude always being something that you can control, being a good teammate. You were just, you just received the 2023 Sportswoman of the Year Award by the Women's Sports Foundation. What does it mean to you to be recognized on such a big stage? Oh, wow. That was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. I was so excited because I got to represent Paralympic team sports. Like we know we see a lot of Paralympians out there, but we don't always see like the team sport Paralympians when we're getting showcased. So I think I was the first woman to win that as a team sport athlete, being a mom and getting this award. It was overwhelming. It was just the coolest experience. Like my younger two daughters got to come and like kind of be a part of that whole weekend. And that was really special for them to see the women empowering other women. They're going to have an opportunity to see you play in 2024 in Paris. I know you also have shared that one of your children has ha already had an opportunity to see you play as well. And so the Women's Sports Foundation also leads the celebration for National Girls and, and Women in Sports Day, which is a celebration that's just around the corner. It's a day committed to inspiring girls and women to play, to be active, and to realize their full power. As a, as a mother of three, how has this shaped your perception of the impact athletics have on the personal growth and empowerment of young women and girls? Oh, I love it. Like, I'm so passionate about like getting young women and girls to get involved in sports. It's actually like what I want to do with my life post sports is okay. personal training with youth. I've just gained so much from sports and granted like basketball is sort of my career. Not a, It's not going to happen for a lot of people to make it a career, but when you just look at all of the little things that you learn along the way, being a team sport athlete or being an athlete at all, you learn like how hard you can work, how hard you can push yourself, how you can push yourself harder than you even thought possible, just learning leadership skills, how to work with other people, being a good teammate like we talked about just all of these little things really can add up and take you a long ways in your life. And I just want all of these girls to experience that, not to mention the confidence building, right? Like finding out that you can do so much when you like start practicing and putting the effort into something. I just love it. And I want other girls to experience that and, and grow up to be powerful women. Yeah, I know for me coming up in sports personally, it just, it taught me so many things because I was not the confident woman that I am now. In fact, being smaller in stature, that often makes the world feel very, very big. And so that was something that I discovered through the game of basketball and leadership and and just how to communicate and, and work ethic and dealing with failures and, and frustration and, mm -hmm. and all of those things that come with the game of basketball and other sports. Do you feel like being on the platform that you're on, that there's a responsibility to make sure that girls are aware of that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's so important to share what we've learned. I think like ever since I became a mom, I've I feel like I've really wanted to to share this platform, like share everything I've learned and really help push other girls forward in their lives and what they can do. And I think being a Paralympian, I get to have this huge platform where I can reach out to kids, kids with disabilities, especially it's nice to be able to reach them at a different level and say, hey, like, look at everything you can do. There's so much you can do with your life and so much independence to be gained and and so much like confidence building that we can do. And I think influence is the greatest superpower any human being can possess. Um, whether you're a, a player or an athlete, a coach, an educator, a Paralympian, the influence to be able to show someone what they're capable of accomplishing or overcoming. Now you hinted just a moment ago at retirement and well, 
Retiring is something nobody wants you to do, but it's something <laughs> that is inevitable. If you're given that opportunity and the game is not taken away from you, you have the opportunity to retire. Now you've said that Paris 2024, those will be your last game. 15 years of playing, again, two gold medals, one bronze and another on the horizon. For the little girl who loves the game of basketball, why is this the time to hang up your jersey? Well, my teammates have made fun of me because I keep saying I'm going to retire and I haven't <laughs> retired yet, but I'm pretty convinced that, that Paris is going to be it for me. <laughs> I've just, I've gotten to a point in my career, like where I've got, like I've accomplished almost everything that I've wanted to accomplish. And now with my kids being so active and involved, I'm finding that I want to put my time and effort into them Mm -hmm. and not as much into me and my basketball career. Like I'm feeling like I'm ready to live vicariously through my children now. Right. <laughs> I feel really good about where the USA team is going at this point too. And I'm just kind of ready to like go really hard, have a great tournament in Paris one more time. And then like pass the baton on to the, the younger girls. Just curious, are you going to be that mom on the sideline that's, you know, whether it's the sideline at graduation or the sideline at a sporting event, that's like throwing the fist and like halfway onto the court. What kind of sports mom are you? I am probably going to be that way. I can't <laughs> help it. I'm so competitive. You know, I was laughing with one of the men's team players who's a dad. He's on the USA men's team. He said he was so out of control at his daughter's soccer game, he realized that he had to keep playing basketball because <laughs> we just can't control ourselves. We're so competitive. So I'll probably be pretty obnoxious as a parent watching my kids and embarrass my kids. But I try to be really respectful because I'm also a coach's daughter, right? Oh, wow. And my siblings right. are coaches. My brother and sister both coach basketball. And so I'm like, I got to be respectful of coaches at all times. Got to set a good example for the kids. But yeah, I'm just going to be going crazy on the sideline too. And when right. I think about retirement, I know when I retire from professional basketball, that came with an identity crisis. I, in the moment, I did not know other things that I was good at. And I wasn't aware that my skills would be so transferable to just about anything. And we hear that all the time, right? The skills are so, those qualities are so transferable. How do you plan to transition out and what will you, where will you go from here? I think that identity crisis is such a real, a real problem like that. It's probably the reason I haven't retired yet, or one of the reasons mm. I haven't officially it's a real retired. Thing. It's a real because thing. Because it is hard to figure out who you are and what you want to do outside of sport. But yeah, I really want to use my time that I've spent on sports, on basketball to like help other help kids like develop into good athletes. I've seen a lot just watching youth sports and stuff. Um like kids aren't nearly as active as like I feel like we were growing up in my neighborhood where everyone was around all summer. You'd go outside and play after school. We played so many neighborhood football games, you know, played ba neighborhood basketball games, baseball. We were doing stuff outside all the time. And I just don't see as much of that. And so then I feel like some kids aren't developing the strength like in their hips and legs at a, as young of an age as as we were with all that activity so i want to help like develop them kids at a younger age so that they're ready like when they get up to junior high and high school to be able to play sports and perform well and be lower risk for injuries yeah i think the lifestyle has changed over the last few decades for sure because you know, as much as technology, I like to call them personal isolation devices, as much as they have <laughs> enhanced our lives, I feel like generation after generation, and I think studies have proven this as well, is that we're active in a totally different way. And so yeah, as opposed to going out in the neighborhood and, you know, for me, Natalie, I would jump from, from roof to roof. Uh, don't tell my mother. 
But those things made me a better athlete. And then also playing multiple sports as well. But I would love to hear more about your dreams of being a personal trainer. Is it just going to be solely on the physical side or are you thinking more mental training? I think I think both are important. Like I don't have any background in psychology, but definitely when I'm coaching and helping kids like develop skills in the weight room and stuff, I really focus a lot on teaching them to really push themselves mentally to reward the effort, like really focusing on the effort that someone's putting in more than like getting to a certain number of weight or, you know, something like that. So I think really focusing on on those things is important for them to learn when they're young. Like you don't have to be perfect. Like you just need to keep progressing and improving. You mentioned confidence there. And that's something that I, I, I'm excited for the young ladies that you coach to, to take from you. Where does your confidence come from? Lots and lots of practice, right? I was a super shy kid and I was like the youngest kid. So I think like you start building confidence, just being around like older kids and the more work you put in, the more you can feel confident in anything you do, like even public speaking or sports, obviously, the more you practice, the more confident you're going to feel. But anything that you practice more and more, you're going to build that confidence. And I think that's just where it's come from for me. It's life experience. It's learning to worry less about what other people think and more about how I feel about myself. Natalie, this is the point in the show where we go into rapid fire questions. Oh, yeah, let's do it. You have a stuffed travel buddy. Is it pronounced Grogu or Grogu? <laughs> Grogu. <laughs> Where's the most unforgettable place you two have traveled together? Probably Chile. All time favorite game day song. Tonight's going to be a good night. I don't think that's the right word. The right. <laughs> I don't, but it's Tonight's like, going to be a good IPs. night. I know that Black Eyed Peas, that is a yeah. great song. <laughs> great song. I got a bad story about that song. We'll talk about it later. Which Paralympic <laughs> game was your favorite to play in? Two th- well, yeah, 2008 Beijing. It was my first. The wow factor, the most amazing experience, and they packed those gyms. It was awesome. That's amazing. And we won gold, so there's that. Boom, there it is. What is something you would like for people to know about para athletes or para sports? Oh, that para athletes are just as intense and athletic as able bodied athletes, that we're training just as hard and as many hours. So we want to be seen as athletes first. Well said, and the perfect way to end our conversation. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us on About Time, and good luck in the upcoming Paralympic Games. Thank you so much, Marquis. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. We are one week away from National Girls and Women in Sports Day on February 7th. And We Coach is celebrating by announcing our 2023-24 Lifetime Achievement Award recipients presented by our partner, Jostens. We will also host a video chat presented by University of Nevada, Reno Sports Management featuring Tina Murray presenting on Unlocking the Performance Code. Please join us February 7th to celebrate all girls and women in sport. And don't forget, Academy applications close February 2nd. We want you with us for our 2024 NCAA We Coach Academies in Denver, Colorado. You can find out more about upcoming We Coach programs at wecoachsports.org. Well, that's our show. Thank you for listening. If you want to hear more episodes like this, be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts into our YouTube channel. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.